this morning, we have some very special guests with us. Um, a few, well, it's been about two years ago, I guess, uh, that George Dunnigan called me up on the phone. He's been a longtime friend of our church and, and helped in so many ways with, uh, with our uh, Celebrate Recovery program every year when we do fundraisers and stuff. And George was always such a big supporter of our ministry of Celebrate Recovery. And, and he said, can I come in and meet with you? We, we have a vision on something we want along the lines of Celebrate Recovery to expand on, on other needs that are needing to be met in the community. And we want to talk to you about it. And so I said, sure. And he came in and he began to share the vision of LifeHouse. And, and of course, the minute he began to share it, you, you know, your pastor, it just, it just resonated. It's like, oh, that's us. Where you just count us in. I'll, I'll get, and so how does that go, Blaine? You better to get you know, forgiveness, then permissions. Like, ah, the board will be fine. We're going to support this. I know they're going to get behind this. And uh, we did right away. We began a part, be, be, be partners with this ministry called Lifehouse. And, and through that process, not even because of Lifehouse, I don't remember what exactly we met, but I met Pastor Philip Houston. He was a pastor at Epworth United Methodist Church. And I think we were doing something, uh, taking care of the homeless during the winter or something like we do. And and then come to find out later, he says, yeah, I'm actually stepping down from my church, and I'm, I'm going to be taking over the directoring, the, as director of Lifehouse Ministry. And, and, of course, the rest is history. And this morning, it is our honor and privilege to, to ask uh, the Lifehouse Ministry folks to come to this stage today and to share with us the vision that God has for them today. Would you welcome Pastor Philip Houston as he comes this morning? Thanks, Brad. Well, first, I want to thank all of you. As Brad said, you guys have partnered w with us from almost the beginning, and uh, we really appreciate that. It's made it possible to have what, what just was a vision a few years ago become something that, that's helped hundred, over 100 people now we've had in our houses. We, have, uh, we do sober living houses, so we help people coming out of substance abuse recovery, uh, out of prison that, that have substance abuse issues, and we give them a place to learn a different way to live. And uh, we have a house for men, a house for women, a house for women with kids now. And I imagine when George was here to talk with you, we may have had the men's house and that's it. But it's been amazing the way God has blessed it. And we just want to tell you guys a little bit about what you've already been supporting and some ways that you can continue to be involved. But, but first, I think it's important that we understand the problem. So if you had to guess out of 100 people, how many of them have a substance abuse problem on average in our country, how many would you guess? <laughs> it's one in 10. One in 10 people have a substance abuse problem. So if you look in this room, say there's 150 of us, that means there's 15 people with a substance abuse problem. Uh, if you go to Walmart, think of all the people there, right? Think of how many of those are, are with a substance abuse problem. Now, out of those 10 people, uh, 10 out of 100, how many of those do you think actually get help? One. One in 10. So if you think, if you just do the math in Eddy County, say there's 100,000 people here, there's 10,000 people that are struggling with substance abuse, and, and maybe 1,000 of them will get help. And if you know about what's available in our town, you know that there's not 1,000 of them that are getting, uh, getting real treatment, unfortunately. But we're trying to change that. We're trying to fix that, and, and uh, we want you guys to be a part of it if it's something that, that resonates with you. How many people, Maria, in your family... Uh, dealt with substance abuse, or did you lose the substance abuse? Um, <clears throat> I just come from a family full of substance abuse. I don't think there's, there's very, very few that have not suffered from substance abuse. I grew up with it my entire life. Um, I lost my mom in September to an overdose, and... Uh, what did you lose the substance abuse, Mark, in 30 seconds? You got to give Mark time limits. He likes to talk. <laughs> in 30, what I lost the substance abuse, I lost a, my wife and family, my marriage of 15 years. And then um, I had an Edward Jones investment office in Colorado that I lost to cocaine and alcohol. And I migrated into to meth and became a felon and basically lost my 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 education from Kent State University because I'm a seven-time felon, living in a tool shed and um, or in and out of jail because of a monkey on my back. So that's how I came to Carlsbad. Yeah. So you can see that that it's been a something that takes a lot from a lot of people, and I think all of us probably know people that have experienced 
either in themselves or in their family, friends, people they care about, significant impact from, from substance abuse. And ultimately, um, drugs aren't the problem. I mean, that's part of it, but really people that are, that are in the midst of addiction need to find a new way to live. And so at LifeHouse, we try to give them the opportunity to do that. We give them a safe place to live uh, where there's a house manager, there's drug testing, there's cameras, we control who comes in and out. Uh, we give them healthy relationships because relationships really are what change lives. And so we have volunteers that come in and do life skills and Bible study and parenting classes. Um, and, and we encourage them to get involved in other places in the community that give them relationships, like their churches, like AA, like Celebrate Recovery that you guys support here. And then we also try to give them practical skills. Uh, you miss a lot when you're in an addiction. You have to learn how to balance a checkbook and, and, and talk to people in, in a healthy way. And so we do life skills classes every week. We do financial budgeting every week. Uh, what would you guys say in LifeHouse has been the, the thing that helped you the most? You can go first, Mark. First of all, the availability of LifeHouse. Um, when I, you know, the cycle before when I would get out of jail and stuff is I wanted why I was there, my, the fog would lift in my head, you know, why I'm sitting in jail and I wanted to live different. You could put me on a lie detector test and I was telling the truth that I wanted to stop using and I want, but when I'd get out, I didn't have no place to go. And pretty soon when you've burned every bridge or anything, you're, you're back to the drug dealer and you're back in a lifestyle and you're, and you're back in jail. And, and so I needed a safe place to go, change people, places and things. And that life house was available for me for that. And I'll just stay with that right now because everything else she said was, a, but the availability of, of me to have a safe place to go that gave me UAs, that gave me a curfew, that gave me boundaries and stuff that, you know, was awesome. It was a godsend. What about you, Maria? What was the question again? <laughs> what about life houses helped you the most? Just it being there for me, um, you know, because I knew going home wasn't an option for me. So I came to I came to Carlsbad and I, I went to Lifehouse and I kind of just, I was able to learn how to live sober and not have to go use for every little thing. And just like the life skills that they teach you, like I never knew how to budget my money and I don't really... I'm not really great with relationships, like personal or any other way, but it's taught me how to just interact with people in a healthy way and how to build these healthy boundaries with people. And it's taught me a lot of leadership skills as being house manager. So one of the things that's made LifeHouse work is that we've had support from such a wide range of people and wide range of churches. Um, we've been going around for the last couple of months talking to all different churches and when people come to some of our events they're just surprised because we have people from you know Catholics and Pentecostals hanging out together and Baptists and Methodists and everybody else we have people that have lots of money and people that don't have anything people that have been clean and sober for 40 years people that have been clean and sober for just a couple of months or a couple of days and and really the strength of it has been that that broad range of support so what do you guys feel like, from the, the sense of the community supporting LifeHouse, what's touched you the most that you've, you've experienced? You know, um, I, work, I work for a company here in town, and uh, the fundraiser, I've been at LifeHouse, April 27th will be two years I've been there. So that's, um, I've got some good footing and stuff. And I, you know, me being house manager and having guys around town and stuff to, Lifehouse, a lot of people know about Lifehouse, and, and, and it's just been very um, generous to, to Lifehouse. I, I asked Phil, like, our, our first fundraiser we had and the fundraiser we had last year and stuff, and I expect to we raise, you know, a minor, minor, you know, a minor amount of money or something. The amount of support that this town gets is, that we get is just um, awesome. But it's from the faith-based, we are a faith-based um, um, facility. Um, I don't know if it's a house, I should say. I don't like calling it a facility. Um, and God supports that. I, I can feel it. You know what I mean? I think that's the what sets us apart from everything else is, is having, you know, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, among, you know, behind the steering wheel. Um, that's it. 
How have you felt the community support you, Maria? Um, I don't know. I've just felt really, since I got to Carlsbad and I've met so many of the, like, the volunteers that come and help and the mentors that come and help are this program, like, just acceptance, you know, and I think that's one thing that I kind of searched, like, my whole life, like, trying to find where I belong and where I was accepted, and the mentors, they've kind of just, like, shown me, like, they've kind of just outreached and... I don't know, like I just feel really accepted here in Carlsbad. And it's it's overwhelming, you know, and that's all God. That's all God. You know, my spiritual my spirituality has been made so strong being here in Carlsbad and you know, and just having knowing that there's resources out there to help people like me or from the life that I've come from and just like embrace it and kind of just like help us out of it. And, you know, and it's giving me a second chance at life, you know, and I love it. Amen. <laughs> well, we could keep talking about Lifehouse all day and telling you stories about how it's changed lives. And if you want to, we'll be in the, the back after church, and we'll stay as long as you guys want to tell you about the program. There's a lot more to it to tell you their stories. Uh, but I just want to tell you guys about a couple of ways that you can be involved if this has kind of resonated with your heart. Mark mentioned our fundraiser. On April 24th, we've got our big annual fundraiser. We need help. We need volunteers. We need people to buy tables. Uh, we need people to donate auction items. So if you want to help in any of those ways, just catch us in the lobby. Let us know. Um, and that's one great way you can support us. You see these wonderful shirts that these guys are wearing. We've got a couple of our residents here. Um, This is another way, if, if you want, we've got shirts uh, for $20 a piece. We've got a few different colors for men and women. Uh, all the proceeds go to LifeHouse. It's another great way, not just to, to support LifeHouse, but to send that message that, that Jesus does love addicts, that there's hope and that, that we care. We want to help people. Um, and if you want to get one of those shirts, that's great. Also, everything we do relies on volunteers. Um, we have up to 25 residents at a time now. We can have up to 14 kids at a time in our house for women with kids. God help us if we ever actually have 14 all at once. But, but we need volunteers. We need people that can help watch those kids when, when we're doing stuff for the mothers. We need people to help with life skills classes that teach budgeting and, and nutrition and finance, uh, uh, relationship skills. And we do our Bible studies. All that's volunteer-based. All the maintenance on our house that we do, we try to keep it volunteer-based. So if there's a way that you think you might be able to help, if you just want to get on our email list so that, that when there's opportunities that come up, we've got a card out there that we'd love for you guys to fill out. Um, and really just if this is something that resonates with your heart, just connect with us and we'd love to work with you. Your support has made it possible from the beginning and it's going to be the thing that helps us keep going. We need to open more houses, we need to help more people, and you guys can help make that possible. So thanks for your time this morning. Let's give these guys a hand. Amen. 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 Thanks for having us here. You betcha, buddy. Bless you guys. Maria? Yes. Thank you, sir. sir. I love sir, you. I love you, too. <laughs> <laughs> She's up there. Well, you know, I just, I, I just love it, man. Mark, I love you, love you, buddy. All right, man. So I remember uh, it was a while. Actually, last year's, right before last year's fundraiser. I don't even know if I told you this, Pastor Philip, but... Um, um, I got a call from Susie Green, and uh, she said, Pastor, um, uh, they're, doing the, they're doing the fundraiser for LifeHouse. And it was like, or, or no, they had just done it, and we'd missed it. We weren't a part of it, and we missed it. And she was frustrated, and she said, yeah, I know. I, I told George, call First Ascendant, call Pastor Brad. I mean, there was a, who are we going to get to help? Well, call Pastor Brad. And George told him, oh, no, they already support us. Oh, no, they already support us. And I said, you tell George, that's not the way we operate, okay? We want to be on the call list. So you need to know, call me. We will be by at least one table. So call me. We'll, we want to be a part. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we cannot do everything. We try here at First Assembly to do everything that needs to be done in this town. Sometimes it feels that way, right? It's like every time I think I'm going to get a break, I add one more thing to the agenda. But the truth is we can't do it all. We can't. We can only change this city in cooperation with one another. 
And when you find a ministry like Lifehouse that's doing it right, that has the right spirit, the right attitude, that has the right of support of leadership, this was built on a very firm foundation, this ministry. And, it, and its success rate is, is incredible, the things that it's accomplishing. And those are the things we want to celebrate. So make sure you stop by the table. Uh, pick up a t-shirt, and Jesus does, does love addicts. Uh, we believe that around here. Amen. In fact, that's a, that's a sermon for another time, but, but I think uh, the, the church needs to hear the sermon that says Jesus uh, absolutely intends for all of his true followers to be addicts. You know, right? When you get out of addiction, you usually have to find something else to be addicted to, right? You, you stop this, and now you're like, we were talking about it, coming home in the van from men's retreat. You know, I, people, they get, stop doing drugs, and all of a sudden, they've got a lollipop in their mouth 24-7. They sleep with it in their mouth. It's like, they've got to have something they're doing different. They've got a new addiction, right? I think Jesus is the best addiction that the world could really take hold of. Amen? And I think when God's people... Start living for God like an addict that, sit, that wakes up and all they can think about is, I need my Jesus. I, gotta, I just got to have my Jesus fixed because I, I, I can't function. I'm having a bad day. I need some Jesus. <laughs> I'm having a good day. I need to celebrate. I need some, right? Okay, that's a different sermon. I'm going to save that one because I like this one and I got to get right to it because God is really... Um, this message was one... I, I'll be, I'm just going to be honest with you. I just finished the last series, right? And next week, we're beginning a brand new series that's going to be based on the movie we're going to see tonight, Breakthrough. So you'll want to, you'll want to be here tonight so you can kind of see where we're going for the next few weeks. But uh, this Sunday was a filler Sunday. I don't know if you ever had those, Pastor Philip, where you're like, I'm going to do this, going to do this, but there's this one Sunday, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've got to come up with something. I've got to fill that spot. And so I'd, I'd been reading about some things in, in my own personal prayer time, and, and, and I thought, you know, I'm going to build a sermon on that, and all of a sudden, I got building this sermon, and oh my goodness, you, you know what I'm talking about? You thought you were just going to do your ob- obligatory thing and read a little bit of scripture, you know, make God happy, and all of a sudden, he just starts to illuminate and starts to start a fire in you, and it starts a little bit of a coals, and then there's a breeze of the Holy Spirit, and it start, those embers start getting brighter until pretty soon, poof, flame starts up. And pretty soon you're kind of looking for a fire extinguisher because you're going, oh my goodness, I'm going to try to preach this on one Sunday. It's going to be good. So I may spend time in my notes just so we get through everything I want to share today. There's actually going to be several more, and I may have a whole series out of this after we do the next series, So, but we'll see. How many of you remember the black and white version television show, Mission Impossible? Come on now. Some of you youngsters, you had to see it on CW or something, one of the, one of the My TV channels or something, they show all the old shows. Yeah, I'm not talking about this new one with this, this, this the, you know, stud Tom Cruise doing all these wild stunts and stuff. No, you know, long before, long before there was an Ethan Hunt, there was a Jim Phelps, right? Played by the famous actor you all know, Peter Graves. Right? We know him, right? Come on. Yeah, that's right. And it was the old black and white shows, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, you know, I go back and watch those. And when I remember when I was watching them as a kid, because I was so, I'm, 60s and 70s, I was what, four? <laughs> Teen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I remember, you know, you'd watch those shows now, and back then they were like, oh, the action. And, and now it's like, oh my gosh, it's like, I can see the string dangling that thing out from the sky. It's just so fake and... But I remember that show, and it was so much fun, I couldn't wait to watch it. And I always knew the show was starting. Why? Because it had that catchphrase, and it, somewhere in the beginning of that show, it would come out. And what was that old catchphrase? Your mission, should you choose to accept it, right, right, right? And you knew as soon as that, oh, it's going to get good now, you know. It's, it's so bad, it's so wild that it's like, oh, I don't know if we want to do this. This is going to really go wrong. And so you just, oh, this is going to be good, right? I love that. Your mission, should you decide to accept it? This morning, I want to talk to you about being missional. About living life missionally. Being on mission. I love that. Uh, that was, wasn't meant to be the title of my sermon. But when I saw the slide, I went, oh yeah, that's perfect. You are now leaving the comfort zone. 
I know we don't, you know, we like that when it's on television, but when it's our real life, and suddenly we realize, listen, somewhere along the line, you're going to come up to a, to a moment where you're going to have to make a choice. You can either stay in the, in, the, in, the, you know, in the slow lane and cruise control and just stay comfortable, or if you really want to get somewhere, you've got you to get out of that lane, and you're going to go, you're leaving the comfort zone. But you know what? That's the life that God has called his church to, to live missionally. You know, did you know that Wikipedia actually has a definition for missional living? Look it up. Meet Wikipedia. I, when I saw it, I went, oh, that's just way too cool. So when you go to Wikipedia and you look up missional living, you'll find this. The adoption of the posture, right? Posture is the, the position you're in. Like right now, some of you are sitting back with your arms crossed. Like, oh, boy, he's going to have to try to amaze me. <laughs> Jim's over here going, no, I just crossed my arms because I'm comfortable. And some of you are like up on the edge of your seat. You know why? Because you're ready. You, you're, you know something's coming. Right? Your posture tells a lot about where your mind and your spirit is. The, the adoption of the posture, the thinking, the behaviors, and the practices of a missionary in order to engage others in the gospel message. That's what it means to live missionally. To be a person who, whose life, the posture you take, the, the thinking, the behaviors, your actions, the, the, who you are as a person is infected and impacted by the mission that you feel God has set you out on. That, that role as a missionary. Why? Because God is engaging you, calling you to engage others with the gospel message to, to make their lives change. You're thinking like a missionary. But here's the thing, thinking like a missionary is just not for overseas or full-time missionaries, right? Pastor Philip here today, he has to think missionally as he leads this ministry. He can't just show up 8 to 5 and give a roof over the head and expect their lives to change. So one of you mentioned it. You said, yeah, you, you, know, you went to programs you, you, were, you were saying you were in jail. Well, you got you, the fog lifted. Man, all these years, of 40 years in ministry and working with street, the folks struggling, years in L.A., working with the gangs. Listen, it, it, they go to the 30-day program and they they get their head clear and all of a sudden everybody goes, oh, well, that, that really worked. They're doing so good. They're going to do so good. Yeah, their head's clear, but then they walk back into the world where, where there's patterns and ruts and things and an inability to do anything with the, for that clear head. So they fall back in. They need somebody that will engage them, their lives, with their actions and their attitudes and with purpose. Pastor Philip, you've got to approach that ministry with purpose, right? With missional mindset. Um, business owners here today. Oh, sometimes I touch my fancy computer iPad and it does weird stuff. Business owners here today have to think missionally. Did you know that? You can own a secular business. Right, Gary? You can own a secular business, but if you want that business to genuinely be successful, you want God's blessing on that business? Did you know you can be a, a secular business owner and experience the fruit of the Holy Spirit? You never have to preach the gospel. You don't have to, you know, everybody in for a Bible study today, so God will bless. No, but you have to have, be on mission. You have to approach that job with a mindset that God gives you to recognize the people that you employ and the people that you touch. It's your mission field. And if you approach it that way, God blesses it, right, Gary? He blesses it. That's what God does, business owners. How about you moms and dads? If you want to succeed in raising your kids so that, quote unquote, when they grow old, they won't depart the faith, you have to think missionally. You have to start from the beginning and realize the things you teach them, the things you say no to, the times that you have to be the tough guy and not the, the close friend. You have to be on mission. If you want the fruit, you have to be on mission. I'm, uh, here's the thing I want you to hear this morning. When it comes to spiritual mission, Jesus makes it perfectly clear. Hear this, this, hear this this morning. God is not saying to you, here's the mission if you choose to accept it. I think the church in America today thinks that's what the scripture says. But that's not what God says. God says the mission is here whether you choose to accept it or not. This is your mission. 
You need to understand, this is the mission. It's not going to change to accommodate to you. It's not, I'm not going to be different. I do not change. Now, I'm not going to force you to do the mission, but if you want the fruit that will come from being the mission, if you want to see God do great and mighty, I want the, man, what's happened to the church in America? God needs to fix the church in America. That starts with the person that's sitting in your seat right now. <laughs> starts right there. Being on mission. So what is the mission? If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 28. Story, pretty familiar. Uh, we'll have it up on the screen here if you don't, if you don't have your Bible with you. But uh, Matthew chapter 20, it's always good to have your, the Word of God in your hand. So if you have it, turn. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Now, keep your finger there for a second. So understand what has just happened. Jesus has died. <clears throat> they've, they've are, they're all freaking out. The women went to the tomb to, to prepare his body. They saw an angel. They freaked out even more. They came back and told the man and said, he ain't dead. Dead man walking. And so, and the guys are trying to, you know, they're wrestling with this and they're trying to, and they, they had given instruction, go to the mountain. Go, so they went to the mountain. Now they weren't like all going, you know, tambourine heading to the mountain. I'm sure they were, because as we're going to read here in a minute, there was a lot of conversations going on. And not everybody was agreeing with what was really going on. He's dead. No, he's not. He's alive. No, he's not. And, and so they're battling. So, so they're headed. They're doing what Jesus asked them to do. But they're not, they're not really, their head's not really in the game yet. All right? Verse 17, when they saw him, okay, so now those women ain't so crazy. <laughs> Dead man is walking. They see Jesus. And, and it says, when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. You just saw a dead man. You know, sometimes in life, you, you want to believe that, you, oh, I believe God. I'll serve God. I'll follow God. No, I, you know, I've been through this and I've been, through, and I'll always, oh, you can always count on me, God. I'm Peter. You can always count on me. <laughs> The truth is, sometimes life has a way of making us doubt the obvious. It's de dead man standing in front of us with life, with a promise, everything that he said is now making sense, and yet there's still doubt. Everybody said amen or oh my. <laughs> then Jesus came to them and said, all authority, this is cool, because he, he shows himself, and they're like, now they're really freaking out. Some are believing, some are struggling. It's still not. And what does Jesus say? Then he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All right? Therefore, and so because it's been given to me, therefore, you... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything. Everybody say everything. Everything I have commanded you, and surely, surely, hi Shirley, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now I love this because I love the way Jesus does this. I, I, Sometimes Jesus says stuff, and it's like he's doing it, and, and it's like he's going, I don't, shouldn't need to explain this. I, I, think, I think this should make sense. What does he say? He says, the Father, I have been given, me, all power, all authority, in heaven, and in all the earth. So get to work. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, you've got the, all the power. You know, I don't get this. I thought you've got all the power. But you know, Jesus is saying this because, it, because it's to him. He's been telling him. He's been talking to him. He's been preparing them. It's like, this is obvious. I've told you I'm going to leave. I died. I've been reminded. I'm leaving. But I said all along that when I left, I would, I would not leave you alone. I would, I've been preparing you. I've been instructing you. So all power has been given to me. And I've already told you, I give you in my name all power to do greater things than I have ever done on the face of this earth. You're going to do greater things than the things that I've done. Through the power that I provide. I have been, so he's now reminding them, now that they're freaking out, I've got all power. So now it's time for you to go and change your world. And what's the, the hidden message? You can do this. Not because you're smart and talented and good looking and you know you can't all be like Pastor Brad. It's just, I'm just, 
You can do this because God is in you. Because God, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to dwell in you. And the power that is mine is at your full access 24-7, 366 days this year because we get that one extra day. And you, every day, it's yours. So go. That's it. Everybody say go. Go, go and change the world. Live in mission. Here's the, here's the goal. Here's the mission. Now go do it. You know, the success, of, I, lo- I heard this one said, the success of an organization is directly, directly proportional to um, the relevancy of its mission. So the success is directly proportional to the relevancy of the mission that you're doing and then its ability to remain focused to that mission. The success is always determined by, okay, so what, what is the focus of the mission you're trying to accomplish? What do you want to do with your business? What do you want to accomplish with your kids? What do you want to accomplish with LifeHouse? What is the mission? And then your ability to stay on task, to keep it relevant, to not get comfortable, to not suddenly start to forget, or, or it gets too hard and so you change path. Okay, this is what we need to do. Well, now it's getting hard. It's tough, man. We got a new group in, Philip, and this, 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 this group here, you know, Jesus needs to take them home real soon. I'm just saying. I love them, but I want to hug their necks till the head pops right off. I just, uh, but you can't change the mission. And your ability to stay relevant to that and stay on task is the absolute determination of the success of that, of that mission the relevancy of the mission, and the ability to remain focused. Take Coca-Cola for an example. Coca-Cola. Did you know Coca-Cola has been in existence for less than 100 years? We've got people that we, well, I don't know if we do anymore. (laughs) Always look at a Jim. He's my first one. Jim Van Zandt, you know. Look at there. He's older than (laughs) Coca-Cola. Less than 100 years that that Coca-Cola has been in existence. But you know, in less than 100 years, listen to the statistic. They did a a study not too long ago, Mark. 97% of the world has heard about Coca-Cola. Now that's, that's a, well, of course, I mean, Coca-Cola's everywhere. Yeah, but we're talking about the indigenous tribes, the hidden tribes in Africa, don't even, never seen a white person. I mean, I mean, 97% of the world, you can walk into a, some, some village hut, you know, and they can't talk your language and you can't communicate, but they know Coca-Cola. Probably got a sign sitting there all rusted. 97% of the world knows what Coca-Cola is, 75% of the world, over 75%, have seen an actual can of Coca-Cola. So to actually manage to get to them. And over 50% of the world has tasted Coca-Cola. 50% of the world has seen it, has touched it, and tasted it. Let me ask you a question this morning. Is the church as a whole succeeding missionally? Do you believe that in the world today, all denominations, stack them all together, the church as a whole, have, has 97% of the world heard an effective message of the name, about the name of Jesus Christ? Has, has 75% of them had an opportunity to genuinely touch it and understand it and experience it? I think if we look at the numbers, we'll recognize church has been around for a whole lot longer than 100 years. And we're not even, we're not, we're not even in the same ballpark as Coca-Cola. <laughs> That's not a good thing, is it? But I'm going to take it a step farther. You know, sometimes you say that to folks and they go, yeah, you know, church. Church needs to get busy. You know? How about our local church? Are we succeeding missionally? Oh, yeah, Pastor Brad just needs to get, get on the ball, get some more stuff done. Uh, you know where I'm going, don't you? Uh, 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 this isn't my job. This is our job. This is our job. The question we need to be asking ourselves is, am I missionally changing my world? Or am I just along for the ride? Am I, have I taken up a, a nice comfortable seat in the stadium? You know, you like our new stadium seats here? You can come watch the show. Or am I living my life saying, God, I know what my mission, you know what your mission is. It's, it's, not, it's like Jesus is going, you already know, I don't need to explain it to you again. You know, you know. Church, you know. If you're here today 
and you don't genuinely know what God wants you to do as far as going therefore into all the world and baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You don't know that part about our mission. See me after church. I'll walk you through it. I think you already know. We have a mission. And the question we have to ask ourselves this morning, am I on mission? Pastor, that all sounds great, and it's always great to hear these things, but the problem is if I could fully understand how to be on mission, it's not that I, it's not that I don't want to be clean. I want to be clean, but I don't know how to stay clean. I don't know how to stay on mission. I don't know how to live that way. Pastor, help me to understand how do I actually, you know, be not that disciple who says the things, I, you know, I, the things I should do, I'm not doing, and the things that I shouldn't be doing, the things that I'm doing, Man, I'm a wretched person. Who can save me? You know, how do I do this? Well, let me give you a couple of pointers this morning. Number one, missional living requires prevailing prayer. I'm not talking about a prayer life that's, that, you know, that, that's, you know, like a lot. Like, I'll be the first one to raise my hand because I, I caught myself this week on the men's tri- trip, you know, praying for the food. Dear God, bless the food, bless the about us. Don't let us get fat. Amen. You know, it's just, we pray, but it's, is, is, is that really on mission? Now, I'm not saying you got to turn every time you pray for your food into bless the missionaries in Ethiopia and, the, and their dogs and God. To, you, know, you don't have to turn it into a sermon. But, but the truth is, when we pray and we're trying to stay on mission, in that private time in your, in your closet with God, are you having uh, just the, the process of prayer like a lot of people do? You know, I, listen, may, most Christians understand. They would say that they understand that prayer is vital, right? You understand prayer is critical for a believer. You, you, you get that this morning? We get that it's vital. One person gets it. That's awesome. <laughs> the rest of you are like, oh, he's going to pick on me if I say amen. I know he is. Here, we know it opens up communication between us and God for guidance, right? We go to prayer because we need to hear from God. We need God to, we need Him to hear from us. We need Him to respond. We pray, and it builds this relationship, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's more to prayer than that. Prayer is about so much more. Prayer is about enabling us. Listen carefully to this. Prayer is about enabling us. In other words, equipping us, giving us the ability. And not just that. It's about empowering, not just us, but empowering God more fully to use us. Your prayer life isn't just about you being better. Your prayer life is about engaging God and His power into your life. God has the power. He has the ability. He wants to move in your life. He's waiting for the invitation. He's a, he's a gentleman. He's not going to force anything on you. When he called those disciples to the mountaintop, he wasn't up there grilling the ones that were doubting. Some were still not sure. And he gets that. But the reality was, he was letting them know, but whether you're here doubting or you're in the boat ready to row, I've got all the power you need. And it's time for you to go. I'm going to equip you and send you. And if you'll go, (laughs) hold on to your hats because it's about to get good. (laughs) I will do what I need to do in your lives. Prayer is not just about letting God know what we need and then giving God the opportunity. It's not just about this, this, this relationship that's a surface relationship. It's about enabling us and equipping and empowering God to use us. To use us to do something, not just in our lives, but to every life and every opportunity around us. To live life on mission. Somebody say amen like you mean it. Remember the scripture, James 5, 16, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And when you pray, and you genuinely pray on mission. It changes the world. I like the way the New Living Translation says that. It says, the earnest prayer of a righteous person, and that's important, righteous. Everybody say righteous. righteous. This is prayer. This is somebody who's right with God. Somebody who wants to, who's genuinely doing the other things to make sure they're in tune with God. <laughs> There's a lot of Christians going, well, I prayed. Yeah, but he's not, he's not sure your voice anymore because you don't talk with him anymore. Your relationship, you're not in right relationship. You need to get that right. Then the prayers will equip something even greater. But it says the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power. Everybody say power. power. 
And it produces, it produces wonderful results. <laughs> the prayer of a righteous man, man, it, it, it engages the power of the universe. And suddenly wonderful things start to happen. So if we pray, we have power. But is that power about making life easier and better for me? You know, that power will make your life better. And it will make your life easier. As you surrender to God, it will make everything that you're trying to, to live life and to overcome, it will make it easier. But that's the byproduct. That's the fruit on the tree. That's not the life in the tree. That's not the reason it's happening. It's the end result of the reason it's happening in your life. That prayer is there to engage the life flow of God up through the roots into your life to make you healthy spiritually, strong spiritually, to make you on mission, to make you somebody who changes your world around you that affects lives and infects lives. And suddenly, fruit starts popping up. You go, oh, that's kind of nice. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I don't think I'll enjoy that. I, you know, I haven't had, a, I haven't had a, 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 an addiction you know, craving for... A month, you know, six months, and it's not like I'm struggling anymore. People trying to quit smoking. Oh, I've been trying to quit smoking. This is my 14th time, and I lasted three weeks this time. I did really good. You know, it's like, and all of a sudden, but, but suddenly this power grows in you, and suddenly a year later you're going, oh, that's right, I, I hadn't smoked in a year. Wow, that's kind of cool. You don't even know what's happening, man. But see, that's the beauty. You plug into the power through prayer and it empowers you and it looses the power of God around you to make a difference. Prayer changes the world around you. Prayer heals the world around you. I'm going to move on. I got more stuff here, but I'm going to, I'm going to skip that. Get ready because I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff, Stephen. And I'm going to cut that. Well, no, I'm going to, I'm going to read this. Remember the, the, the scripture in Mark 9, the, uh, the person with the de demoniac son. I do want you to hear this, so I'm going to read it fairly quickly. But uh, you could just turn your ears up a notch. You can hear quickly. All right, here we go. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around, crowd around them, and the teachers of the law were arguing with them. I love this. They came to the teachers of the law. They needed a miracle, and a fight broke out between them and, and the disciples. I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, I, I think I know why they were fighting. Coach, I think I know why they were fighting. Because they came and wanted answers, and suddenly the disciples felt inadequate. They probably tried to pray for them. Just nothing happened. They realized they couldn't do it. And so they were, you know, this, this is your fault. You know, if you'd have lived better, you're the one that's sinning in your life. It's your generational curse. I can't break that. It's your generational curse, right? And a fight breaks out between an argument between the disciples and the people that are desperate for a miracle. And they're arguing with each other. And Jesus walks up and he goes, what are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him on the ground and he foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples. So in other words, there was a problem here. That's a, that's a problem, right? You start foaming at the mouth, rigid, flopping on the ground. That's a bad, that's a bad thing. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. So they came to the disciples for help, but the disciples, for whatever reason, couldn't do this miracle. So the argument started, and then verse 19, Jesus responds to this, but he's responding, careful to who he's, who he's talking to, or this is important, who is he really talking to? You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Who's the unbelieving generation here? It was the disciples. I mean, the people, I'm not saying that the people, you know, had it all together, but they did believe, right? They came. So they had some level of belief. They didn't know where to turn. They believed to Jesus. Maybe this is the chance. So they brought him to Jesus. It was the disciples who were struggling with their belief. And Jesus said, you unbelieving generation. Come on. Bring the boy to me. Bring, just Let's not even talk about it. Just bring him here. So the father tells the boy's story. And he goes on. And he talks about all the details more in depth to Jesus. Because he ever met people like that? You know, they gotta, but I got to tell you all the story. But it's really, I got to tell you all how it's all going bad. You know, as a pastor, sometimes I'm just like, can we just cut to the chase and pray? 
You know, this, let's stop giving devil all the praise here and talking about it. You know, well, praise the devil. Tell all of the power that he has. You know, let's just let's just sit God on him. How about that? Let's just get after it. And so, so he shares it all, and he, he, you know, this is and clear. He makes it clear this is no hangnail miracle. And oh, could you pray for my hand? I got a hangnail. It's really bothering me. No, this is like this guy, my son. This is serious. Verse 22, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him, but if you can do, anybody know it? You can read it. Is it up there? Oh, oh I'm sorry. No, I, I, actually, this verse isn't up there, I don't think. That's why he didn't have the slide up. But if you can do anything, that's what he said. But Jesus, you know, this is how bad it is. But if you can do anything, and I love Jesus' response. <laughs> this is... I you know white boy can't do funk, but I'm just I'm just saying. It's like it's like Jesus looks at go say what? If I can, did you just say if I can? All the brothers in the house say, hey Amen, bro, go get him, sick him, sick him, Jesus, sick him, you, you if I can. Well, you probably wasn't that attitudinal, but <laughs> if you can, said Jesus, and then listen to these words, everything is possible. Everything is possible. If you believe it for your son, then it's possible. Father says, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. And I've been there before. That's, that's, that's often my, you know, I do believe God, but there's still part of me going, boy, boy, boy this might be different. Everything is possible. I hope God is able. I know he has for others. But this is bad. This is really, really bad. And everybody's tried. Even your disciples, they couldn't do nothing. You know, but Jesus takes control. I won't read the rest of it, but basically, just in a nutshell, he turns to the boy and he says, Spirit, get out. <laughs> That's pastor's way to just cut to the chase. Get out. You don't belong here, and I'm taking authority of you. And that spirit was cast out of that boy right there. It was an exciting Pentecostal. We're a Pentecostal church, Pastor Philip. We believe in miracles. We see God do miracles. We stand, and when we do, we shout it. We, we dance it. We, yeah, hallelujah. God did a miracle and drove that demon out because that's how God operates. He is a God on mission for his children. But here's the rest of the story. It says, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, this kind of miracle, this kind of thing, can only come out only by prayer. Not fluffy prayer. You know, true prayer. True prayer is an expression of your faith. It is believing that God is able no matter what the circumstances say. I don't know what the end result's going to be, and I don't know if it's go I'm going to be healed, and I don't know if God's going to provide, but this much I do know. My God is able to do it, and if He chooses to do it, it's going to happen, and I know the, the only way that I can engage in him, that power, His power, into my life is that I be a person of prayer. I be on mission in my life. I give Him the opportunity, and I call upon Him to do the miracle. Well, He'll do it if He wants to. No, He won't. He won't. You know, sometimes I believe the reason why, why God isn't answering our prayers is because it's ritual prayer. It's empty. It's meaningless. It's, it, it lacks the connection to God. It lacks the, 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 the driving fire that God can and will do this. And I think God sometimes just says, you know what? I'm not going to do it yet. Not till I see you really mean it. Which I'm not going to go into all of it, but that's the second part of, that I wanted you to get today. Living on mission requires prayer that's prevailing. It's not just a, a something we do. It is something that defines us. Out on the table out there, there's a, there's a clipboard there for Carl's bad praise. We've got dozens of people that have signed up that pray every week, Pastor Philip. We're believing God in the, in the months to come. We're going to launch this into every uh, church that wants to join us in the city of Carlsbad. We want to bathe the city of Carlsbad in 24-7, 365 days a year prayer. We want somebody in the city praying for this city, for our community, for our region, every day of every week. And we believe God can do it. We believe there's enough godly people that will say, I'll, I'll take my stand. I'll, I'm going to dedicate an hour 
of my life that I'm going to pray. And there are, we got dozens on that list, but let me tell you something today. And you know what? You leave today if you haven't signed up yet. I preached on prayer. I think I told you it's important. You probably ought to sign up today if you haven't signed up. But here's the thing. Signing up means, no, means nothing if you're not praying missionally. If you're not living on mission. If you're just doing something out of obligation, it won't, it won't, it, it, it's, it's cotton candy. It's really not going to change the world around you. But if you'll let prayer become a part of your mission, to, to go before the Father and say, God, there's thousands in the city, in this community that, that need life house. There's thousands that need celebrate recovery. There's thousands that, that they need help and they're not reaching out. God, reach out to them. Draw them in. God, open doors. Do miracles. God, there's, there's mothers trying to raise their children on their own in this city and they can't do it. They can't survive. There's children at risk in this community and they're engaged in this situation that's going to destroy their lives. God, God, move in my city. God, inspire me to do something to make a difference in this world. God, I want to be on mission. And I'm not afraid to do whatever you ask me to do. Yeah, I want you to pray. And I want you to sign up. So does Jim and Charlene. But I really want you to mean it when you do. Because if it's not a prevailing power prayer in your life, it's not going to keep you on mission. And, and the second thing that will always keep you on mission is a desperation for God. That's what will make your prayer powerful. When you realize that this is too big for me and it's too impossible for the world and it's, too, it's a serious situation and I am absolutely driven to make a difference. I can't wait until tomorrow. Why is ritual prayer not enough? Why does our prayer life have to get to an 11 before the world gets changed? Listen, the task is too great and the resources are too few and we need God. If you haven't caught on, we are fighting an uphill battle when it comes to the spiritual things in this world. We are not the nation we were when our forefathers established this country. We are not a nation that's driven by its spiritual principles. Far from it. And we are fighting an enemy that rises up stronger than ever before against us. It's like everything wants to silence us. Everyone wants to silence us. If we speak up, we're the bad guy. Even if we're speaking up in love, we're the bad guy. But here's the thing. The mission hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. And I know it's harder than ever before. But the mission is still the mission. And the world still needs God. And they need the Jesus that can empower them and change them. And miraculously take them from death into life. It's the only answer that's going to save this world. Whether they get it or not. And we are the ones that he has come to and said the mission whether you like it or not, is to join me and let me operate through you. I have all the power that's necessary. Don't, don't bind to the lies. That you can't fix that kid that won't listen. You can't, you can't change that drug addict that, that, that just doesn't want to quit. You can't, you can't fix this marriage that's too far. You don't buy into the lie that the world tells you that, the, that you have to be, you have to listen and be the one that accepts everything instead of speaking the truth and love into their lives. If God said it, then it's truth. Don't be the one that's silenced. Stay on mission. Because we're called to live missionally. Stephen? I've been waiting to tell you something. It started with the fisherman. He taught them a new way of life. He turned everything upside down to make it right side up. Forgive seven times? Try 70 times seven, he said. Just be nice? No. Give it all over, whatever is asked of you. Reach over the tracks. Yeah, go to that part of town. <laughs> Cling to the eternal and shake off the chains of this earth. Sin messed everything up, the whole world, but he made it right. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy and honored is your name. Your kingdom, it's come. 
I'm pledging my life to bring it closer and closer, to show the power of your divine love, to declare deliverance from death and sin. To all people, to each race in every language. Making disciples of all nations, I'll own my responsibility. Go all in and make it real in my corner of the world. The authority Jesus has already been given. The kingdom that will come on earth as it is in heaven. An everlasting dominion that will never pass. Because he beat death. Coming as the king of the Jews and finishing it all as the king of the world. His throne and authority are sovereign. You heard right. Forgiveness without boundaries. Hope in all circumstances. And a peace that passes understanding. Because death is conquered, eternal life is established. That's why we keep going. Why I keep telling. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The root. The offspring. The bright morning star. Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. From street to street. Nation to nation. He is the King. Power and glory belong to Him. His kingdom will have no end. There's room for you and room for me room for everyone who calls on the name of the king and his name is jesus the name above all names the first and last the one and only and he loves you and he loves you he loves you and he loves you and that is what i've been wanting to tell you bow your heads with me won't you This morning, we've talked about living missionally. And as we enter into this Easter season, we hear people declaring like they did on this video, and and it inspires us, it reminds us of the beauty of what happened on that Easter morning. Life came out of death, promise. Death was overcome. He went to hell and took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Our eternity opportunities are set and fixed. We... We can know where we're going. And yet in that same Easter experience, there were still those struggling with the realities of their life. And even in the very presence of a dead man walking, they still doubted because they, because they were overwhelmed by, by the things of that, that life. We sang about it in the songs today. But God, you are the way maker. You are the miracle worker. You are the one who not only inspires us, but you are the one who equips us and empowers us to not only change our lives, but then to change our lives in such a manner that we become addicts for Jesus to where there's a driving force in us that says, it's not enough for me for my life to be good. It's not enough for me for my life to be better. It's not enough for me to be better today than I was yesterday. God, I want it all. And I want it all for my family. And I want it all for my children. I want it all for my friends. God, I want to be a living epistle. Somebody that lives out faith. I want to be on mission. So quit me, God. Empower me, God. In a moment, I'm going to pray that God will help each and every one of you in this place. As you leave this, our living room here today, that you will take what you've heard today and not let it be just a warm, fuzzy feeling. That was good, Pastor. That's a good one. That's right up there, Pastor. I was inspired. You're not genuinely inspired unless you leave here and it impacts change in your life. That's what real inspiration is. I'm going to pray for you for that. But before I do, There may be some of you that are here today and even though I talked about it and even I talked about being on mission, the truth is it doesn't quite sink into you and you can't really embrace it and you can't get excited about it because there's a part of you that knows I'm not even in relationship with Jesus. I'm not one of his followers. Oh, I'll go listen. But I've never, I have not, I'm not living right now where I have genuinely surrendered it all to God so that He can help me to get on mission. And you will never experience the love of God and the peace of God and the provision of God until you take that first step. It's critical. This is a mission you've got no choice. This is the mission that determines your eternity. 
So with nobody looking around, if there's anybody here today that would be honest and say, Pastor, that's me. I, I really am not living for God. I'm just not. I mean, I'm not going to explain it all. Your stories may be all different. But you're just saying, I am not in real relationship with God. I need to take care of that first so that God can then equip me and empower me and I can be on mission because I want to be addicted to Him and not to the things that are controlling my life. If that's you today and you would like me to pray for you and say, I want my life to be all about Jesus. I want Him to be my Lord and Savior. Raise your hand. Keep it up for a moment. Just raise it up. Just keep it up. Yep. Yep. Hands all over. Yep. Praise God. Keep it up. Anybody else? Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. You can put your hands down. I'm looking, I'm looking at hands of folks that, I, that are new in faith, and I'm looking at hands of people that have been in faith for a long time. Guys, do you know what that says to us? It, say, it reminds us that it doesn't matter how long you've been in church, how long you've been around the whole God experience. You're still, you're still, your journey is still different for you. It's not enough to hear about Jesus. It's only when you re- embrace Him and accept Him that things truly begin to change. So I want everybody in this place to join those that raise their hands as we pray this prayer together. Everybody pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, I need you desperately. I know you are literally the only thing that can change who I am. I don't like me the way I am. I know I break your heart. But I know you love me. And you have a plan for me. And it is to bless me. And not to curse me. It is to give me eternal life. To give me back the Garden of Eden. Which I was made by God. To walk in the presence. With you. So today. Forgive me God. I won't make excuses. Yesterday doesn't matter. Only today and tomorrow. So forgive me. Take my sins from me. Set me free from the burdens of those things that have held me captive. And now set me on my new path. And as the joy of the Lord floods my soul, And in that place of excitement and exuberance, tell me my mission. Because I'm ready to accept it. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in this house today. I thank you for this word that has been brought through the power of your Holy Spirit. They're just words on a page, but when your spirit takes hold of them, when your spirit takes hold of the word of God and brings it alive in us, it's more than words on a page. It is the very bread of life. It is the power. It is the strength. It is the reminder that God is fully engaged. Just like that day when the disciples were wrestling with doubts and uncertainties. God, we wrestle with doubts and uncertainties. But in those moments, I pray that your spirit will speak to every one of these folks and say, just listen to my words. Go. I got this. I've got all the power you need. I've got everything you'll ever need to to be successful. I can help you to be more than you could ever ask or imagine. I'm ready for this. All you need to do is get on mission. Listen carefully. Take hold of what I say and go. Help us, God. To leave this place and not just go to lunch. (laughs) Let us go into our mission field. Jesus' name. Amen.